talking today with Mike Van Drummel of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. All right, Mike, can you start us off with some background on yourself uh, to begin with, where and when were you born? Uh, I was born in uh, 1943, June 19th, here in Grand Rapids at St. Mary's Hospital. Okay. Now, did you grow up in Grand Rapids? Yep. I grew up in Grand Rapids, and uh, when I, when in my young years, it was uh, I thought it was a nice place to grow up, mm -hmm. nice town to grow up in, and uh, played a little baseball, uh, loved baseball, still love baseball, and uh, yeah. And what high school did you go to? I went to Grand Rapids Catholic Central. Okay. And when did you graduate? 1961. Okay. Now, while you were uh, growing up, uh, what did your family do for a living? My dad, oh gosh, dad had uh, several businesses. He used to be a foreman out at General Motors on Ann Street, near Ann Street, and uh, during the Korean War. Mm -hmm. And after the Korean War, he was, uh, he had his own gas station, he had his own grocery store. Uh, but he, he was kind of entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. but he, he was like a setup guy. He liked to set it up and then move on. Mm -hmm. But when you have a house full of eight kids, you know, that's kind of hard to do. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a little bit of a struggle. All right. Now, what did you do after you finished high school? When I finished high school, I didn't want to stay in Grand Rapids because it was either get a job in the, in the auto industry or the plants here or mm -hmm. steel case or whatever the others. Uh, and I remember I had a great interest in aviation and I saw an ad in a magazine for Northrop a College out in California, in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. near the airport, for uh, aircraft mechanics. And I thought, boy, that, that sounds interesting. So I enrolled, and uh, in November of 61, I left Grand Rapids on the Greyhound bus all by myself and went all the way out there and uh, started school. And uh, I think it was the second or third week in November. and. Uh, this stuff was new to me. Uh, I had a class of about 30, and of the 30, there was only two of us had no military experience. And when they were talking this aviation stuff, and boy, I don't understand that. You know, I had uh, I went to a parochial school, and I said we didn't have shop. We didn't we didn't mm -hmm. understand any of this stuff, and uh, it was kind of like a hindrance for a while. And I kind of got depressed. Uh, I was meet my grades were mediocre, and then. I was going to change. I told mom, I says, I'm coming home. I'm going to go to Western Michigan. She says, why don't you hang on for 30 more days? Mm -hmm. And I did. And things started changing and uh, got better and better and finished finish my training and uh, took my FAA test and uh, got my license. And then uh, they tell you, well, you're not going to, you know, chances of getting a job with the major airlines are kind of slim because you don't have any experience, you're too young, and you got the draft in front of you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember going to, uh, out in the valley, to uh, Rocket Dine, which is part of North American Aviation, and filled out an application. I'm sitting in the office. She said, we can have an interview for you this afternoon. And I'm sitting there looking at all the pictures. I said, do you want to get into this? And I thought, nope, I want airplanes. So I walked out. And went back to the school, and I talked to the school president. And mm -hmm. he calls up TWA. He says, I got a guy here. He's got his license. You need any mechanics? And he said, no. He said, they have an opening for fleet service. And I said, what's that? And he said, they clean the airplane. I'll take it. Mm -hmm. He sent me right out there. I got hired. And 10 months later, I, be, I was uh, into maintenance. And uh, I just loved it. Never had a bad day. Loved that place. Loved the airplanes. I come to work hour, two hours early, and just walk around the airplanes in the hangar. I just loved it. <laughs> All right. So, so you got you got to you know, see the planes and go inside them in different places and yeah. explore. And they didn't have the security problem they yeah. do today. You know, I could I could walk right on right in the hangar and uh, you know and walk around the airplanes. All right. Now, uh, how long did you do that before you got a draft notice? Oh, let's see. I got my draft notice in the fall of 64. Okay. And uh, I had a bid in. I had transferred from Ch Los Angeles to Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I had put another transfer in for Indianapolis. And I, I got the transfer. And uh, I called my mom that night. 
in, Gra in Grand Rapids. And I says, Mom, I says, uh, I'm moving to Indianapolis. She says, I don't think so. I says, how come? She says, I got a letter here for you from the government. Mm -hmm. You know, and it says, you know, for, I'm, greetings. You have hereby been ordered to report for reduction. Well, that was it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Now, at this point, had you done any... Um, kind of physical or thing like that already when you were 18 or 19, or was this your first contact with the system? With the... Uh, Draft system. First contact. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So then what was your first step? Did you go someplace in Grand Rapids or Detroit for a physical, or what did you do? They... Well, well I, I, I moved from Chicago to Grand Rapids mm -hmm. after I got the letter. Yeah. And had a couple of days there to sort everything out and pack everything away and, and uh, got on the bus in uh, downtown Grand Rapids, the Greyhound, went down to Fort Wayne, mm -hmm. Detroit, and uh, spent the, a day and a night there. And uh, we were sworn in there and put us on the bus and they drove us, rode us all the way down to uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky. All right, because I guess you had... Uh when we were going into the interview, you said that you actually started in, in the middle of 65. So, but now you were, but your draft notice comes late in 64. So when did you get to Fort Knox? We got there, uh, let's see, well, it must have been January, uh, yeah, it was sworn in on January the 7th. Okay. In 65. Right. Okay, so it's January. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those deals where they line everybody up, take one step forward, raise your right hand. That's okay. it. <laughs> okay. Okay, so January 65. So you get, the, you get the original notice late in 64. Right. But you're not actually reporting for duty, per se, until... Well, they, I, they, they were trying to... I guess they were trying to locate me. They located me in California, mm -hmm. and then I had... I had no idea. I had, a, I had my physical in downtown Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and never had any more paperwork from them. Right. So I had just transferred from L.A. Mm -hmm. to Chicago, and that's where they <laughs> located me. So, All right. Uh, a certain amount of back and forth. But anyway, but now, okay, you've, you've gotten yourself down to Fort Knox. Uh, what kind of reception do you get when you arrive at Fort Knox? Well, if I was, if I was 18, I, then I think I would have been more afraid. But uh, I was 20, 22 already, and, and it, I had an ex-Marine tell me. Mm -hmm. this, he said, uh, do what they tell you, don't say anything, and uh, you won't have any trouble. And I did. I, I, I listened to the orders and followed everything around that we were supposed to do. And uh, I, I thought it was kind of cool. It's interesting. You know, reception station, yeah, that was interesting. Yeah. Now, when you got there, did you take a bunch of tests and things at the beginning or just start yeah, marching around? Yeah, we, we took a bunch of tests. Um, I, th I think, uh, I remember going to... They used to march us from these offices, you know, and then I remember the guy saying, and what did you do in civilian life? And, I, and, and then he opens up this big book and he looks, are you familiar with propellers and so on and so on? And he, yes, I am. Are you familiar with and, and that? And that's yeah. what he was doing, you know. Mm -hmm. and so, uh, and out of that is probably the reason, one, one reason after I left boot camp was the fact that uh, I never got advanced infantry or individual training because mm -hmm. they already, I already had it in the civilian life. All right. Now, while you were there, how long did the boot camp last? Eight weeks. Okay, so it's an eight-week course. Yeah. Uh, and, and how were you spending your time during those eight weeks? Well, we were in, we I had we had the new type barracks, the 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 block cement block barracks, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, they were quite comfortable, I thought. And uh, me and a guy from Detroit had a uh, room to ourselves, and uh, we had a wonderful guy, uh, Sergeant Cunningham, was our platoon sergeant. Uh, he had a smoky bear hat, barrel chested, wonderful guy, and uh, I never. It's it's like once they learn your name, then you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. As long as you do what they tell you, you're okay, you know. And I did. I try try to maintain a low profile, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I got along re very good. I I, I liked. Uh, Sarge took care of us. Uh, Caught us eating some of those little fried pies up in the in our room once, and he says, "I told you guys not to eat this stuff." So that was it. I don't want to see that again. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> All right. So they so they didn't really do overkill with the discipline. No, I don't think so. I remember, <laughs> I remember when we'd have to go to breakfast or, or formation, 
You have to go around the building, and, and they, would, they would lean out of the office, the, the orderly room, and they'd no, no walking in the company area. We had to run, and then we had to do the parallel bars before we went into the end of the mess mm -hmm. hall. I always, I thought this stuff was funny. <laughs> okay. You know, how, how physically demanding was the training? I thought it was great. I thought it was, I thought it was great. I, I remember the first time I had to do uh, the mile run, and I was huffing and puffing and wheezing. Right at the end, when, they, when you take that final exam, uh, I did a lot, a lot better, mm -hmm. a lot better. It was, it was the best, probably, physical shape that I had been in in my whole life. All right. So you basically understood fairly well what it was that they were doing and just went with it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you get to the end of the eight weeks, and then you get orders for what you do next? I, I remember the graduation day. Uh, they posted everything where everybody was going, and I remember looking on there, and you had a certain, uh, like an MOS. Mm -hmm. Well, I, they had me set up for cook school, and I thought, oh, my gosh, that can't be true. So I went in and talked to the sergeant. He says, he says, uh, what well, cook school? He says, he said, I've only got so many guys going to cook school, and it was a typo. Okay. Boy, and I tell you, my, my heart dropped. You know, and I thought, oh my gosh, I got an aviation background, and mm -hmm. I'm going to cook school. Well, yeah, that's the army. They do that kind of thing. <laughs> so anyway, he says, I got only two guys going to uh, aviation. And he says, that one of them so and so, and the other one was Van Drummel. I said, that's me. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, they sent me down to Fort Benning, Georgia, mm -hmm. and uh, after what about what they give you for leave about two weeks before the report varies, but yeah, yeah, and I and I got down to Fort Benning, Georgia, and it was raining, and I think it was end of March, early April, right. something like That'd that. That'd be about right. And uh, this is all new again, all new, and we were way out on the backside of Fort Benning, way out in the boonies. And uh, this was an AV, a helicopter outfit. And uh, as much as I didn't care for helicopters, it was still aviation, you know. And okay. So you were assigned directly to a unit, so you were not in a training class? Nope. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, and so I was that new guy. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, the young guy. <laughs> well, so did they have a, a, a group of guys there who were a lot more experienced or just, you know, a few months ahead of you? Oh, yeah, yeah. They didn't, uh, and, and, and most of them were uh, military uh, aviation. Mm -hmm. uh, as I learned years later, they, uh, the commercial industry does not really care for uh, uh, military training, you know, in aviation. Uh, I remember the general foreman in Los Angeles told me, he says, we want to train you the way we want you to be. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was a minor thing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so the fact that you had that civilian aviation background it made you look a little funny as far as they were concerned? Yeah, I think it was. I, how, it, I think they were wondering, where'd this guy get his license so young and all that, yeah. you know, and where, where's this background? And, and uh, you know, I, I, it was kind of, there was kind of a click there, mm -hmm. you know, and you were, you were on the outside. And I got to be friends with a guy from Delaware, and he was one of these guys that, he knew how the system operated, and he and he says uh, we got to talk, and we were good friends. And and he says, you don't want you don't you don't want to helicopters. And I says no, I'd like to get into fixed wing. He says why don't you put him for a school? So he talked me into, and we mm -hmm. I picked out a, a uh, instrument repair school, mm -hmm. applied for it, and I put the paperwork in, and then I got summoned to the office by the executive officer. And he says, I, I notice here that you, uh, you want to go to instrument repair. Do you have any experience? And I, yes, I do. And he says, what have you done? And I says, uh, I work with uh, Transworld Airlines. And he says, uh, Transworld Airlines. And, uh, and I says, he says to me, uh, why do you want uh, to go to school? And when he got this kind of background, and I says, well, I had a person tell me that the only way to get out of uh, helicopters was to apply for a school. And he says, you want to get into fixed wing? <laughs> he, said, he starts riding. Mm -hmm. He said, "There." He says, "You're no, you're now in fixed wing," and they sent me to a Mohawk outfit, and it was just like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, two or three guys says, "You know, you're a draftee. They're not gonna monkey with you. You'll, you're you're here forever." <laughs> and I, I walked out there. He said, "They, they put, put me in fixed wing." <laughs> All right. Uh, explain what a Mohawk unit is. 
Uh, the, the unit I was with uh, did aerial surveillance. Mm -hmm. we, had, we had six airplanes. They're a twin engine, tr a twin turboprop airplane uh, built by Grumman and a very good airplane. And um, we had three SLAR airplanes, side looking airborne radar, mm -hmm. and we had three infrared airplanes. And this is what they used to take aerial surveillance with. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, we had camera operators, one pilot, one camera operator. And uh, after the flight was over with, they would take the magazine out and have it developed. And we had our own lab right on our unit there. And a good friend of mine uh, from Massachusetts, he was uh, a little Eddie Kehoe. He was the, uh, uh, worked the lab. And those labs were transportable. And you open the door and you go in. They're all stainless steel, whole place inside. And that's where they did all the film developing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it was very interesting. I like the airplane part of it, but, I mean, he was the air camera part of it, so I'm... All right. Now, did they, when you joined the, the fixed-wing unit now, uh, did they treat you the same way that the guys had with the helicopters, or were you kind of more into the system now, and so you're just a guy transferring in? Well, you, you always run into the guys that have seniority, mm -hmm. or what, time and grade, you know, yeah. and they, they and he, the new guy is always kind of on the periphery, you know, and uh, we... I got into that unit and was with them for, oh, maybe a month, maybe a month and a half before we got orders from Lyndon Johnson to go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And we were, pa most of the time I remember we were packing. All right. Now, to back up a little bit, now when you got down to Fort Benning, uh, you, you joined, uh, was a specific company or unit that you joined when you got down there, uh, and they were part of what larger unit? I can't remember the designation of the unit. It was some something helicopter transport outfit. Okay. But were they, they had Hueys? Yeah. But were they part of a division? Yes, it was. But when I got there, it was not the first right. cab. It was the 11th Air Assault Division. Right. And then what happened with the 11th Air Assault Division? Well, right after, oh, let's see. We were we were uh, the colors were brought back from Korea of the first cab. Mm -hmm. And they were given to us, the colors of the 11th Air Assault Division were retired, they were rolled up, and we were there at the big stadium. And uh, you could see that kind of presentation on a We Were Soldiers movie. Mm -hmm. And we were now officially the 1st Cav Division, and it wasn't maybe a week or two, and Lyndon Johnson, uh, I remember we had, it was 12 noon, and we, everybody said, go to the day room, there's going to be an announcement. So we were watching TV, and he, he says, I've ordered the 1st Air Cavalry Division of Vietnam. And I said, well, that's it. I better call Mom and let her know. Now, before that happened, were there rumors going around that you might deploy or go someplace? Yeah. Or were you aware yeah. of that? Yeah. Yeah. There was, uh, there was a pretty good indication because I think of the background of the 1st Cav and the testing of the 11th Air Assault. I think mm -hmm. this was probably going to be their crack unit that they were going to test in the field. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and, and by this time, the Marines had already started going in. Right. Yeah, and I think like 173rd Airborne had gone in. So there were some American units already going over by the time that... that yeah, and there was, there was elements of, uh, of the 101st over there. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I remember uh, when we arrived over there that the 101st, uh, one brigade cleared our area mm -hmm. for it. And I remember this young black guy coming walking out with an M60 over his shoulder and his... Pant leg was tore way up, and, uh, he, and I thought, "Oh my gosh!" I said, "These guys, you know, they were, that was infantry boy. Mm -hmm. They and they cleared our area for us, and uh, I was very thankful. All right. It was a new experience for me. Okay, but let's gonna go back here to the point where you you get the word. All right, you guys are all going to Vietnam, and so you're packing and so forth. Um, now, how did they get you over to Vietnam? We left. Uh, early in the morning, about, I think, 5 o'clock, out of Fort Benning on buses and went all the way across the southern part of Georgia, headed for Charleston, South Carolina. And at Charleston, on a Sunday afternoon, we boarded uh, our ship, which was the General Alexander Patch. He was a, kind of like a World War II he was. general yeah. uh, in Europe, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, that evening, we, uh, we left. And... Uh, it was warm. This was, I think it was August, 
and uh, most of the guys slept out on deck at night, and uh, you kind of wake up. They every once in a while, somebody said that they clean the stacks, you know, mm -hmm. and and all this soot comes out, and you're you wake up and you, you just cover with this soot. But uh, yeah, we went around Cuba through the Panama Canal, and then we went up the coast of Mexico to uh, Long Beach, California. We docked there for a day. We took on more troops, and uh, I just. We were only there about 24 hours, and then nonstop over to uh, across the Pacific to uh, Quinyan. All right. Now, what do you remember about that trip across? Oh, I remember we ran into a storm uh, about mid-Pacific, and this this ship only had I think one screw on it. And I remember we I volunteered for this detail where we would bring stores up for the mess hall, mm -hmm. and uh, after our duty time was over we would throw the trash off the fantail. So going out there, you didn't, and the, the ship was pitching so heavy that the prop was coming out of the water and it would slap the water, you know. And uh, it was kind of spooky. Yeah. And then they had to go on there with these wooden crates and they throw them over, you know. And I didn't know they did this stuff like that. You know, it's, of course, it's, you're not dealing with uh, uh, evil submarines, you know, right. where you're leaving a trail across the ocean, you know, mm -hmm. where they can follow you. Yeah, and no environmental activists yet either. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So you're, you're, but you're bouncing up and down on here. Were you worried about falling off or getting washed well, overboard? Well, yeah, using my hand on the handrail, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, this was new to me, especially when the ship was pitching so yeah. much. And, uh, yeah, we pitched it off and we got back, but... Uh, a lot of the guys got sick, mm -hmm. but uh, I got queasy, but I never got sick, you know, where, the, where you're going to do something. And uh, got back, and uh, I remember getting back in that bunk, and it was about five, five layers. Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that was an experience. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, uh, uh, do you have a sense of how many men were on that ship with you? I'm guessing, uh, I think, about 2,000, okay. maybe. So you had a lot of different units from the division kind of on there. Yeah. Were, were you carrying, uh, now, were, did, your, did your planes fly over, or did they? They were carried on the uh, aircraft carrier Boxer, Okay. all the helicopters of our unit. And uh, there was another one, too, that they used, and I cannot remember the name. Mm -hmm. But uh, why, why the name? Um, Maury, the Ro Maury Rose or something like that. But anyway, I'm not sure if that was it. But I know the boxer was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, you, you, you get to Queen Yon. Um, now, how do you get off the ship? Are there docks there now? Or do you yeah, we, we woke up. It was early in the morning, like 6 o'clock in the morning, and they started to disembark. And uh, they, they had these landing craft alongside of the ship, mm -hmm. and there was no netting, like World War II yeah. netting where you climb down, you know. They had a, 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 a ladder, a, a with steps on it, mm -hmm. and when you got to the bottom, you know, everything was kind of like rolling, and they, and they said, wait till the thing comes up to the top, and then jump. Mm -hmm. And that's where we, we had to do this timing, where you would time yourself and jump into the boat. And then you said, stand there, where you got all your combat gear and your duffel bag and everything, and, and uh, the place was so green. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't believe that. You know, this is a, how can a war be going on here? The place was beautiful. It was, like, it, was, it was like Grand Haven at mm -hmm. its best. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, basically, so it actually, it, it has been, I think these days, is again a beach resort kind of place. Yeah. Uh, all right, so you, 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 <laughs> you land there, you get off the ship. Uh, what do they do with you once you're on shore? They marched us right, right over to uh, CH-47 Chinooks, and we boarded Chinooks, and they flew us 30 miles, uh, I think, inland to uh, Anke. All right. And we got off the Chinook and on K, and we had a certain little area, and they, they laid us out. This, this unit, the unit I was with, mm -hmm. the general support, uh, we had to line up all of our little pup tents right in a row, pitch the tent, and uh, that's the way it was for the first night. I think mm -hmm. we were there for at least maybe two weeks, and uh, learning how to wash yourself with your steel helmet full of water. That was a new experience. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, one of the guys noticed these holes in the ground that were about as big around as your your pinky, maybe a little bit larger, and uh, they were pouring avgas in there, and these big, huge spiders were coming out, 
And I thought, oh my gosh, what a night we're going to have tonight, you know. <laughs> and so one guy, the first night we were there, about 2 o'clock in the morning, some guy got bit in his, in his uh, pup tent mm -hmm. with a snake. And I thought, oh, this is going to be a long year. <laughs> be a long year. All right. Uh, now, those first couple of weeks, are you um, working on, air, on the aircraft yet? Are they there, or are you just kind of... No, it was just like clearing the area. Okay. Cleaning brush, uh, making an area. And this, and this was not the area we were going to be assigned to at the airstrip. Mm -hmm. We were still in the division area. Right. And it was just like uh, cleaning the area. And uh, we'd do these little chores, do this, do that, move those stones, move whatever. I remember watching uh, some ordnance people come over. They were blowing trees down with dynamite mm -hmm. and uh, touching the battery on the on the jeep. Yep. You know, and I thought that was cool. <laughs> right. uh, that, do you remember just being hot or just? I not, thought not it was. Bad? Yeah, it was warm, but it was not miserable warm. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, it was comfortable. It was like a nice summer day. I didn't. Have any, I didn't have any idea that the monsoon, uh, we had not gone through a monsoon right. yet, and, uh, and the humidity was mostly tolerable. Mm -hmm. now, that's not saying that the guys in the infantry, when they got out in the jungle where it was worse, you know, it's just, but where we were was pretty good. We were in the central highlands. Yeah, you're a little bit higher elevation, so it yep. can cool off at least a little bit at night. And yeah, I thought yeah, it was. And you're not getting rained on all the time yet. Right, not yet, not yet. I'm, all I'm, right. Uh, now, while you're first kind of getting organized and, and, and setting up, uh, do you see any Vietnamese people or...? Yeah, okay. one, of the one of the first things, uh, we were driving to the uh, airstrip uh, in uh, one of the trucks, and I remember this Vietnamese pedaling his bike down the road, and there was a dead dog tied to a rope he was dragging. Mm -hmm. and I thought that was their sight I have not seen before, and uh, said, "Yeah, they eat them," and I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a young kid from Grand Rapids, you know, and you don't it's the stuff you don't see all yep. every day. Yep. All right. Yeah. Uh, now, so how long does this sort of first stage go on, where you're just sleeping in two About a tents? Month okay. Before yeah. we went to the airstrip, mm -hmm. and we were on we were on sea rations for almost a month, and when we got to the airstrip. We went on B rations, which was pretty good, you know. They're prepared by the a mesh mm -hmm. cook, right? Uh, but everything was in cans yet, and it was another month or so before they had their regular mess hall set up. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we got our, our assignments at the airstrip, we were at the uh, I think the southern end of the airstrip, and uh, we we had all in GP tents, big tents, and. Mm -hmm. Within six months, they were all dry rotted. They were all ripped uh, because of the heavy rains and then mm -hmm. the, the heat. But uh, yeah, we had we had two tents that we went through in uh, just the 11 months we were there. Now, uh, were these ones? I mean, did you have sort of floors that were above the ground, or were you just on the dirt? Mo most of the guys that I was with in my tent and the other tents in our unit was uh, they would buy lumber mm -hmm. and make an elevated platform, right. maybe three or four inches tall, mm -hmm. just to keep their stuff off the ground. And it worked. It yeah. worked well. Now we had to sleep in a mosquito net every night. Right. Okay. Now, did did you get rats in the tents or things like that? Or did yeah, we got rats. Uh, I remember one night I was laying on my side. I was sound asleep, and then I felt something come right up the side of my leg, and it sat right on my hip, and then it went down, and then it was gone. And I, <laughs> that's it. I don't want to know because uh, we we got those big rat traps in the tent, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, Set it, and I remember sitting there one night. I was reading a Newsweek magazine, and the, inside the mosquito netting, all of a sudden you hear, Pshaw! and you look up, and it caught him, caught the rat, and right by the arm, mm -hmm. and you know they, they took him outside and mm -hmm. did what they do with them. And rats, we had rats like you wouldn't believe. I never knew there were so many rats in that little area. Right. The, the, when you set the traps, is there a particular kind of thing you use for bait? I think they were they were get a, they'd get a can out of the mess uh, trailer of peanut butter, mm -hmm. and they'd take a big big dollop of uh, peanut butter and put it around the, and they loved that because that salt, yep. you know. And uh, yeah, that was uh, I. Uh, 
All right. Uh, let's, let's see. But now, but when you move out to the airstrip now, have you have the, have the airplanes come in? Do you get to go to work now? Yeah, all the airplanes had come in. Uh, we also had another unit attached to us. They had uh, I can't remember if it was two or three bird dogs. O one bird dogs, the little one, the mm -hmm. little high wing, uh, like uh, forward air controllers would use. Right. And uh, they were on one side, and they and those they had only two mechanics there. I think with a couple. Of maybe three pilots that there and most of the pilots uh, we had several of them too were uh, warrant officers and uh, a lot of people don't know about the warrant officer situation you know and that was uh, I always thought that was an interesting thing mm -hmm. you didn't have a lot of uh, the the field grade officer stuff that you had to put up with and the warrant officers always looked like they were in retirement village you know <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know but they, nice guys though nice guys I had a one of our officers, uh, pilots, was uh, Captain Williams, and I uh, always thought he was a nice guy. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Yeah. Now eventually, I mean, warrant officers wind up flying most of the helicopters and that kind of thing, and yeah. they will start to get pretty young eventually, too. Now, at this point, are these still older guys with some experience as pilots, or uh, are they about your age? Or I thought they were older. Mm -hmm. I thought they were older than us. They, they might have been. You know, they, they, they looked... They looked like they'd been around. Some of them were W3, W4, mm -hmm. you know, which is, I think, the highest rank they can get in the warrant. But, uh, yeah, I, 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 and they were, they were, they would talk to you more than the, the uh, field grade officers, mm -hmm. the company grade officers would, you know. And uh, I, 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 you could, you'd notice there's a definite separation there. Mm -hmm. They could fly the airplane, and the other officers could fly, but the warrants were always kind of partial to the, the regular guys right. to talk to, you know, right. and uh, yeah, we had uh, and my our, my uh, maintenance sergeant was Sergeant, uh, uh, I think his name was Roy Walker, nice guy. I liked Roy Walker. He was uh, very very good, but uh, and I, I'm not sure who the company commander, our platoon commander, was there. Mm -hmm. I know he was a major, and I I want to say Taylor, but I don't think that's, I I'm not sure about that, you know. Right. But uh, yeah. Just, just for, for the record here, what was your company? What was its designation? Uh, we were the 11th General Support Aviation Company and also the ASTA platoon, Aerial Surveillance and Target Acquisi Acquisition. Okay. All right. And, and so how many guys did you actually have who, that you worked with in that platoon? Yes. Maybe about 20. Okay. So a pretty small group. Yeah. Now, now, did you know the rest of the company pretty well, too, or just your own guys? Just the own guys, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, maybe two or three of the names I remember, right. but uh, I, I, I can see faces, but I can't put names to them anymore. Okay. So once you get the, the planes and you're now working the flight line and, and so forth, we're kind of getting into September toward October around that time. Yeah. Uh, were you busy right away? Well, it, as far as the, the the mechanical part of the uh, of the job is, yeah, we we had uh, the runway that we used was uh, pure steel planking, mm -hmm. you know, and we'd have C-130s come in there on a daily basis, several, and they would pound that that runway, and they would they would break mm -hmm. parts of the metal, and at night, uh, the army welders would go out there and weld it. Because they, those things, those jagged pieces of metal sticking up would flatten those tires sure. like you wouldn't believe. And that was part of the, what I did with the Mohawks. Is the Mohawks were getting flat tires all the time. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the big things. I, I changed so many tires over there. And uh, I remember a starter generator in particular, because nobody else had the experience. And Sergeant Walker, he came and he says, yeah, he says, you know how to do these. And he says, I'm going to let you do this one. I said, oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it works out good. I, I we were busy. Okay. Did you not, know? Yeah. Not not really busy like you're breaking a sweat for you know eight ten hours a day. Mm -hmm. But it was it was steady. How many times a day would, would the Mohawks go out? Oh gosh, I mean, it depended on on what airplane they were using too. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were uh, we we were not allowed to carry have any guns on them. Just mm -hmm. photo, you know, photographic. Right. And uh, there were some units in Vietnam had uh, Mohawks with the gun pods on them, but we, we weren't authorized. Uh, I would guess 
maybe three or four times a day. Okay. Now, you're there. I mean, the first CAV gets in, in, involved in the battles in the Adrang Valley kind of in November there, so not too long after you arrive. While that was going on, did you know anything about that, or was anything different around that time? Well, I di I, we never heard the terms I drank. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. All we knew was there was a big increase in traffic, and the planes were coming and going a lot. Mm -hmm. And I never knew, I mean, because the first CAV uh, always had some type of operation going somewhere. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, this, I remember this one infantry guy, I picked him up once, he was hitchhiking, and he told me, he says, uh, he just came back out of the field, and I said, where were you? And he said, he mentioned some area, and, and, and you're talking to these guys that have actually been in combat, mm -hmm. and he, he was kind of chastising uh, the, co the helicopter pilots coming in, picking them up, the wounded, and he... He, he he says they weren't coming in because the lead was flying so heavy. Mm -hmm. But uh, overall, I think that uh, you know these. I just I just have a warm part in my heart for these guys. Mm -hmm. I was so fortunate because of my situation that I wasn't in the infantry. I was glad I was not in the infantry, right. but I admire the guys that were. Mm -hmm. You know, this they're 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 real heroes. They really are. Now, the planes that you were working on, uh, now, did these, uh, did these ever get hit or take battle damage? Yeah, we had, we had several of them got hit. In fact, uh, some of the slides that I, I've taken when I was in Vietnam, I took uh, battle damage on them, and mm -hmm. usually one of them in particular looked like about 20, milli 20 millimeter round went through the wing mm -hmm. and made a pretty good hole. And, uh, yeah, we had well, there were small bullet holes in them. It was, it was one of the deals that the, we had to do constantly was repair the, the airplane. Right. Did any of the planes ever get shot down? Never lost a one. Okay. Can't let, we went with six and had six when I left. So I don't know what happened to the other when, after I left, but they all right. were all there. Now, did you have kind of a daily routine that you went through just doing your job? Not really. It was it all depended. It was it was kind of similar to what the airlines you know are like. Uh, there's no two days the same and. You go by a, like a gig sheet where uh, the you know flight comes in, and you have to look at the log book and f see what the pilot wrote up as uh, a problem or a possible problem, and that's that's what it was. And since I was, I had this uh, aviation background with the airlines. I mean, I got those tire jobs, mm -hmm. and we had oodles of main landing gear tires. Hardly ever lost a nose landing gear tire, but the main gear tires are the ones that really. And most of them were blown. They were cut open. You know, a brand new tire, and they only fly it once, and here it is. You've got to pull it off because it's yeah. all ripped to shreds. But, uh, yeah. All right. Uh, so you were kind of on, on call, in effect, or when they needed yeah, somebody well, we to had, go do we something? Had pull, we had to pull our own guard duty in KP, too. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in, regarded as an insecure area. They would not allow the Vietnamese in to uh, do laundry or anything like mm -hmm. that. So... Uh, I remember in particular, I came back, I, used, I would volunteer also for, uh, they said, uh, you want to be exempt from duty for a while. And I says, yeah, what's going on? And he said, well, they're going to run a five-strand barbed wire fence around the entire airstrip. And uh, I says, yeah, I'll take it. And uh, so I had one strand mm -hmm. and another team of four guys. They would, I had four Vietnamese and myself. Mm -hmm. And the first thing we did, we worked with a surveyor, we drove the stakes. And then that, that took a couple of weeks. And then we started stringing the barbed wire around the whole airstrip. And uh, I had two, uh, four Vietnamese, and they would come up after a while, and they'd, look, they'd grab your wrist and look at your watch, and they'd go, break, break, break. <laughs> and I thought, oh, 10 minutes. I said, okay. And I, would, I stopped at the PX, and I bought a carton of, Palmel cigarettes, mm -hmm. and I always take it, and I didn't smoke, but I took the a package with me every day, and I give them, they loved American cigarettes, mm -hmm. and those guys, we would go through these uh, deserted rice paddies, and these guys would come out, and they'd have a couple of leeches on their ankles, you know, and I'll tell you, that was, it was nice, nice people, boy, I, they work, work very hard for you. And we strung the barbed wire around the whole airstrip. And uh, I remember the, 
of the four Vietnamese that I had, two of them were related. One was the father, one was the son. Mm -hmm. And the father had the, the old cone hat, straw hat, and the long goatee, you know, and I thought that was right out of National Geographic. Right. You know. All right. Now, were you using the uh, old-fashioned barbed wire that actually was barbed wire? Did you yep. have, you see, you didn't have concertina wire at that point? Nope. We had barbed wire. All right. Uh, now, what kind of actual, now you said you, you did guard duty. Were you on a perimeter, or did you just walk around, or? Uh, it depended. Uh, we, sometimes we had to watch uh, the area, one, they were designated areas, mm -hmm. but the area that I had once in a while was where the officers were. And... Uh, we just walk around, and we, we kind of notice occasionally that nurses would uh, come up, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, you know, for the most part, it was, uh, uh, we were right alongside the Song Ba River, and uh, I, one, of the, one of our locations was there, and we, we would make a, a routine circle and walk back, and, and, uh, and, and, and at night, and you don't have a flashlight, it's kind of spooky, you know. Especially when you know who's who could be out there, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, yeah, it was interesting. I spent many many a night in the foxhole there, though, along that river. Especially with the aerial flares. That's interesting. Okay, I explain what's going on at that point. Like, uh, as far as so uh, you're on you're on guard duty. You're on the perimeter. Oh yeah, or we 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 have uh, it's some most of the officers were good. Mm -hmm. Most of the officers were good, but occasionally there would be one guy or maybe two that would not behave accordingly. And, uh, you know, we were authorized when you're on guard duty. I mean, they, they didn't want us walking around with no rounds in the chamber. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if, if, you, if you got into a situation and all of a sudden they said, yeah, he found him, uh, he was dead, and he had no round in the chamber. You know, and most of the guys says, we're not going to be caught like that. So they loaded, mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, there was there was a couple of situations where I remember one of the guys said that if the he had an officer <clears throat> and he he wouldn't identify himself and he says okay get down on your hands and knees and he ran him through the whole routine and you know with the with the uh, he put your ID card out in mm -hmm. front of you and so on yeah I've I've heard the horror stories you know we we had a few. Yeah. It well, was a, what could go wrong with that? Or was that just you have to make the officer go do all that? Yeah, well, you, you, you kind of you wonder if there's going to be retribution, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you got, you got transferred to an infantry outfit. Right, right. <laughs> okay. now, yeah. now, how dangerous was the base? Did you ever get mortar or rocket attacks or snipers or anything like we that? Got, we got more. The Air, Force, the Air Force, one particular time, came in and they parked two C-130s down at the little... Uh, ramp area and it was about two o'clock in the morning we had to go on alert because uh, they mortared the v the vc sympathizers mm -hmm. of the vc from the village mm -hmm. came in and put satchel charges along alongside the landing gear and uh, i've got colored slides of that they blew blew both tires flat mm -hmm. and they put a satchel charge inside the uh, nose inside the access door in the nose and they blew a big hole right through the fuselage. And the other airplane, uh, it was just like, kind of like uh, harassment. They just shot, put some bullet holes in the engine. Mm -hmm. Well, you get a bullet hole in the engine, now you gotta pull the engine. But uh, that was the last time the Air Force ever left the airplanes there overnight. Mm -hmm. They never did it again. And uh, yeah, we got mortared uh, two or three times. We spent the night in the foxhole. They shut the generators down, and you're sitting in the foxhole, and you just wa wait and watch. And the, they would come over and drop the flares, and, and you would take a look, and uh, you, you think you'd see movement, but a lot of times the eyes play tricks on you. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you got to be sure. Now, aside from that incident where somebody got on to attack the, the, the C-130s, I mean, did you have sappers who would get onto the base and, and cause problems? Yep. Yeah, we did. Several times. What kinds of things would they do? Uh, and I'm only speaking for my area, mm -hmm. and that was... Uh, we had an infantry outfit right at the, our end of the airstrip that were protecting us. Right. Now, although we had to pull our own guard duty, mm -hmm. but the infantry outfit was right there, and they had they had a 50 caliber mount there, and we felt safe right there. These guys knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, 
I can't speak for the rest of the division because, uh, well, there was uh, one, of the, one of the papers I have of the first CAV, I, ca I saved uh, two or three of them. Mm -hmm. And we had a mascot, which was a mule. And somebody on guard duty killed the mule. <laughs> he said, he said, he, he, said he, he saw movement and it did not respond to mm -hmm. the shot. There you go. <laughs> there goes the mule. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, when you were pulling guard duty, did you have any um, particular scares or things where you thought you saw something going on? Or Well, I remember one night when it was, uh, we, I was in a foxhole on the, on the edge of the river, and we were elevated. And uh, it was windy, and it was cool right after uh, monsoon rain ended. And uh, the flares, the ships were coming over, dropping the flares. I remember one of the flares went off, and then I, I looked down this ravine going down toward the river, and I, th I, I thought there was a thousand Viet Cong coming up the hill. Mm -hmm. It just looked like it because of the way the leaves were reacting. Right. And uh, yeah, that was it. And I, I asked my buddy, I said, does that look like there's trouble down there? And he says, no, not really. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> All right. uh, it was an experience. All right. Uh, now, how, when, when the monsoon comes in, how does that change what you do or how the unit operates? It cut, cuts down on the, our ability to do our, perform our job mm -hmm. uh, and the, the whole aerial surveillance thing because of... Uh, I've, I've, I've got pictures of the line where all the aircraft are sitting and the mud is about six inches deep. And it gets on everything, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it was hard to work in. Uh, you get something stuck, it was hard to get it pulled out. Uh, and I was not used to monsoon, and it was constant, just constant rain. It would let up for, it would let up for a period during the day, but it would come, and it would, it would rain at the same time almost every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, beautiful mornings, but boy, by the afternoon here it was raining. And uh, it, it would last for a month, maybe two months. That was that's where our tent went dry rot. <laughs> right. Uh, now, physically yourself, I mean, did you have any problems either with tropical diseases or just accidents or other things like that? I had, uh, I sprained my ankle. In fact, we were, we were moving uh, boxes in the maintenance area, and uh, rats came out of there. There must have been maybe two or 300 rats. It looked like a, a sea of rats. Mm -hmm. And we moved the boxes, and so I jumped up on this bunker, and everybody had rocks, and we were chucking the rocks at them. And uh, I jumped down and snapped my ankle over and wound up getting a cast on that. And uh, I was climbing into a, uh, one of the trucks. My foot slipped, and I cracked my shin, and it, I just didn't think anything of it. And it must have broke the skin because about three days later it's red, and so I thought I better go to the hospital. So I went to the hospital, and he looks at it. And the doctor looked at it, and he says, "You want to lose your leg?" And and I says, "No." And he says, "You get you get something bacteria over here." He said, "It's mm -hmm. nothing like the United States." Mm -hmm. And uh, he put me in a mass unit, and I had eight shots within in three days, and it did clear up, but I still got the little scar from it. Mm -hmm. It uh, nasty. It kind of brought everything right out front as far as hey, this is this is no picnic area yeah. here. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, in the picnic department, uh, what what did you do when you were off duty? Did they have entertainment for you or photography? I got into photography mm -hmm. big, and I bought my first 35 millimeter camera, and uh, then I bought another one. And there was two guys. One guy was from New York, one from Wisconsin, and they were kind of amateur photographers. And I really started following mm -hmm. and, and watching what they were doing. And I just took a lot of pictures when I was there, a lot of pictures. Now, and would you develop your own pictures there? Or? No, I sent, I sent them out for, I always did slides. Mm -hmm. and slides, has, uh, to me, was more color saturated. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd get them back and look at them. And, yeah, these are good. So I sent them home to my mom and dad. And let them look at them, and they keep them for me. But uh, and I and I did some movies. I took Super 8 movies over there, and uh, I just sent those out here a couple months ago and had those put on DVD. But uh, the movies are okay. It's, it's it seems like it brings back memories quicker than the slides do. Mm -hmm. 
you know, because you see stuff moving. Right. And, uh, yeah, it was, uh, photography was a big thing, uh, really got into my blood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, did they, uh, did they bring in USO shows or things to NK? I mean, did you get entertainment or movies or that kind yeah. of thing? Yeah, we had, uh, oh gosh, I saw, I saw Eddie Fisher. Uh, what's, what's the, uh, Jackie DeShannon. I don't know if you remember Jackie DeShannon. Not personally, but the name's familiar. Yeah, right. and uh, uh, Eddie Fisher and Bob Hope. He brought his, and he came in unannounced. Uh, this was like a day or two after Christmas mm -hmm. in 65. Yeah. And uh, he came in unannounced, and uh, he said, I w and I just got off guard duty. So I'm on my bunk sleeping, and a guy comes, come, he says, Hey, wake up, Bob Hope's coming. And I said, oh, my uh, and I felt like a dish rag, you know, but boy, you get your gear on and, mm -hmm. and get your camera and uh, head out. And he wasn't very far. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had, who did he have with him? He had uh, Anita Bryant and he had Les Brown and his big band. Mm -hmm. And he had Miss USA and he had uh, Joey Heatherton. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, wow, look, this is neat. And uh, he put on a good show. Very good. I always respected Bob Hope. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful person. And uh, for what he did, he gave up his Christmases for so many years and entertained the troops. Yeah, good person. Mm -hmm. right. Now, did you ever get off the base? Yeah, I did once. Uh, they, they had in-country R&R. I went down to Vung Tao mm -hmm. on the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had, took a picture of it. And it was a nice little white building, two floors, completely surrounded with concertina wire. Mm -hmm. You know, I, wow, <laughs> this is this is sandals, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, I was down there for three days. I just walked around uh, Bung Tao, took pictures, and uh, it, it's, it's not much different than where I was. Mm -hmm. And then right after I got back, they said. Oh, just an opening came up for Hong Kong. You want to go to Hong Kong? I said, mm -hmm. no, I don't have any money now. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I missed that. I, uh, a lot of the guys went to Hong Kong. A lot of them went to Bangkok. A lot of them went to uh, Tokyo. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I went to Vung Tao. So. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> At least I got out of there for three days. All right. So you're there basically kind of late, late summer 65 and sort of the full year into 66. Mm -hmm. uh, how were things different by the time you left? By the terms of what was going on or what the place was like or anything else? Well, they, the division always had these uh, big operations. I, I can't remember a lot of the names for mm -hmm. them, like Paul Revere or uh, uh, what's that one White Horse or something like that. But uh, you, you never knew where, I never knew where the, the bulk of the infantry units were right. operating, or the 1st Brigade, 2nd or 3rd. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, because our, our job was always aviation and, and mm -hmm. aerial surveillance, and that's yeah. what we did. Whenever the planes come in and we had to do something, we did it right there, and, and we didn't know where they were. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was, uh, yeah, there, a, lot of, a lot of the operations were uh, Pleiku area and north and east of us, mm -hmm. which would be, I don't know what the name of that, that uh, what, was, what was our, uh, we were second corps. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if we ever got up into I Corps. I'm not sure, but uh, I know maybe I, I know the first CAV years later went up to a system yeah. at uh, yeah, and that sort of Kason. Yeah, and so so early '68 they, they they go up to I Corps for a while, but yeah. um, at the time you were there, you're pretty much kind I of. Cu I couldn't believe when Corps. that uh, Tet offense happened. I just couldn't believe that when I left there, I thought this is going to be a snap. I mean, mm -hmm. we've got them. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> So would you say morale was pretty good, at least where you were the time you were there? Yeah, yeah, it was. It was, uh, the morale was good. Uh, I think I always thought things were kind of upbeat. Uh, mm -hmm. They had a handle on it, yeah. at least we thought. Now, the time you're there, and again, this is fairly early on, were there discipline problems of different kinds? I mean, you hear all of the stuff about Vietnam, about race or about drugs or about insubordination, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, did you see any anything like that, or? Well, we had we had one young black fellow with our unit, and uh, 
I always was sympathized with him because he was kind of like a, a, like a like a bookworm type person. Mm -hmm. Very very nice, very very intelligent, and uh, he he got picked on by a couple of people, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't like I didn't care for that, you know. And I always always wonder whatever happened to him. I know what his name is, but uh, I tried to Google it once and mm -hmm. nothing came up. So uh, he was yeah he was he was a nice guy. I liked him. He was, uh, and I and I honestly don't know what he was what his function was, mm -hmm. uh, you know. There, you know, you can be around a bunch of guys and not even, what do you do again? Yeah. <laughs> I remember our store's clerk. He was a young guy from uh, New York. Uh, I remember, come to think of it, you know, as far as the mechanics go, I, I, don't, I don't really know that many more. Mm -hmm. I always thought I was the one that was doing, doing everything. Right. <laughs> uh, now, was your unit mostly white? Yeah, mostly yeah. white. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we had a, I always thought the, the uh, first, first Cav Division uh, commanding uh, General, uh, General Kennard, I thought he was per, just a wonderful guy. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you know anything about Ken General Kennard. He, he was in World War II at Bastogne when, uh, during mm -hmm. the Battle of the Bulge. And I saw him on TV when I was watching the show and, and I thought, that's my old commanding officer. Mm -hmm. And he survived. Wow, boy, what a bunch of history he was. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I took a picture of him. Uh, he came over to the, our 11th uh, General Support Outfit at the uh, airstrip. We opened, uh, we put this building up for, uh, it's kind of like a, a church or mm -hmm. a little, uh, we call it a cinema gog. We would yeah. so, show movies at night, and mm -hmm. it was our church for on Sundays. Right. And uh, he came over for the dedication. And uh, I took a picture of him, and so I got a, pic a slide with mm -hmm. General Kennard on there, and he just passed away. He was in his 90s, and I thought, well, what a, what a, I was lucky. We had, had good people. Yeah, well, you know, you, you've got, you know, a, a pretty, at that, that point, still a largely professional military outfit that you're with. Mm -hmm. Now, over the course of the year that you were there, did they start rotating people out before you left? Oh, yeah. Yep. And how did that work at that time? Because you came over together as a group. Then what happens? Very few of the ones I went over with in my unit rotated back before us. Okay. Most of the rotation was happening in the brigades, the infantry, mm -hmm. and, you know, and that was one of the sticking points, I think, that Hal Moore said, because they were losing guys from the, from the line because they were rotating back and they were losing this experience, mm -hmm. you know, and, but it, with our unit, it wasn't noticeable. Uh, I can only remember maybe two or three guys coming in, mm -hmm. new guys, you know, and that was right toward the end of our tour. Right. And then, where are you guys from? And I remember, the, remember a couple of them were from uh, uh, Carolinas and Georgia, you know, and, uh, but it, it, was, uh, it was not a major problem with us. We didn't have that kind of a, a situation. Mm -hmm. We, we uh, but there was, when, when you left, did you just go by yourself, or was there a group of you who went out together? Or? No, we, when, when the orders came, I mean, we, we got to the end, and all of a sudden, people started getting orders mm -hmm. to rotate. And we never knew when it was going to be. And then all of a sudden, he says, uh, Van Drummel, you got your uh, rotation orders. So they, they give him the, the sheet of paper, and mm -hmm. he said, okay, I'm, I'm leaving on so-and-so date. And... Uh, uh, I thought, oh, gee whiz, I have to say goodbye to my friend, you know. He was my buddy, and, and uh, uh, well, that was it. I mean, you just, that morning, you get up, you get all your gear together, you go across the airstrip, and I got on a CV-2 caribou, and they flew me over to play coup, mm -hmm. and I spent one night in play coup, and the big uh, Air Force C-141 Starlifter came in from Manila, and... We got on board, we, we had our dress khakis on with our combat boots and got on board and they, we flew from there to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines and they refueled. We have to get off the airplane. Mm -hmm. Air Force won't let anybody on board when they refuel. So we had to get off and refueled, got back on, flew up to Yokota, Japan and we got off, I think it was two in the morning and uh, walked in the, uh, the little mess area they got there and uh, had my first hamburger in a year. <laughs> first hamburger. And we got it, and we waited, I think it was about 4, 4.30 in the morning, and we all boarded. 
and then took off nonstop across the Pacific uh, to Travis Air Force Base in California. And we landed there as the sun, saw the sun come up, mm -hmm. sun go down, and the sun just went below the horizon when we landed at Travis. And uh, that was, and then the, the big airline strike was on. I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. that. There was five major carriers went out on strike. <laughs> and they all knew, the guys that were in my unit knew that I was worth the airlines. Mm -hmm. And one of the airlines was my airline. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> so one of the guys made the comment. He says, says you, guys are, you guys, you mechanics are making too much anyway. And I said, Looks like you're going to have to hitchhike all the way across America. Mm -hmm. You know, I I was true to my airline, but uh, right. let's, yeah. to back let's back up a, a little bit uh, back in into Vietnam again. Uh, 65, 66. Are there guys on the base who were smoking pot by then, or that kind of thing? Or never saw it. Okay, never uh, saw not it. Not really there yet. No. Nope. Okay. Uh, when I would asked about going off the base, would you go into the village of Don K at all? Do they let you? Yeah, we did only in daylight. Mm -hmm. Only in daylight, and. Uh, there was uh, I, there was one, one thing that I ran to ran into that I never saw before. It was uh, the the local people would chew this uh, stuff called uh, betel nut. Yep. And it was had a slightly narcotic effect to it because mm -hmm. of their bad teeth, mm -hmm. and it would kill the pain. And when you would walk in behind one, and one would spit on the ground, and it was all bloody red. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was blood, and they said, "No, that's betel nut." They chew it. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was a, that was different for me, and I remember buying a big wash aluminum wash pan f so I could shave and wash up. I bought that in the village. Uh, there was not much I did down there. We mm -hmm. we would pick up French bread, and bring French bread back to the area, and uh, at night we would go out on raids and we'd go to the mess tent or the mess trailer mm -hmm. and grab uh, jam and peanut butter, mm -hmm. and then we'd go back to the tent and cut that bread open and we. would Slather that right. peanut butter in there. All right. Now, did some guys go in, into the village for um, less healthy things? Yeah, they would. Yeah, they control that quite a bit, though. Uh, Canard, General Canard, I know that was one of the uh, spots where they would regulate that quite effectively. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, when they would, uh, things started going out of whack as far as the currency. Mm -hmm. Uh, prices started going up and up and up, and then all of a sudden they came out and they changed the color of the MPC. Right. And that would kind of tone it down again. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that was funny. I, I still have some MPC left over, and uh, it looks like Monopoly money. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's all we had. Yeah. That's all we had. And they would change it periodically <laughs> to keep it out of the black market and everything else like that. Yep. Yeah. All right. I uh, think back over that course of the year you spend in Vietnam. Are there other particular incidents or things that happen that tend to stand out in your memory that you haven't brought in here yet? I remember when we first got there to the airstrip, and we were we were uh, cleaning the area. We had a big, huge brush pile, and they started to burn it. And uh, there was a mortar round inside, unexploded. And mm -hmm. I was not close to it. I was like maybe. 50, 75 yards away, and boom, it went off. And it hit one of the guys that was a camera operator in the airplane, hit him in the back of his uh, upper arm. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had to evacuate him. And he was back about three weeks later, maybe four weeks later. But I thought, this is serious business mm -hmm. here. And every once in a while, though, we would find one. We'd find one stuck in the ground. Yeah. And the first thing, you know, walk away from it and call, call the... Uh, Sergeant over, and then they would call a ordinance outfit in. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that was that was a that was a pretty good explosion, boy. It was. I mean, I, I couldn't get over the fact that somebody out there was trying to kill my mother's son. Mm -hmm. I just I couldn't accept that. Right. <laughs> Is that the kind of thing where they're just kind of cleaning up an area and scooping up a bunch of stuff, and there's just an unexploded round in the middle of that? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody either put the, put the brush pile in the wrong spot, you mm -hmm. know. But uh, I, I, I don't know, because when I remember moving, we we pick up a huge bunch of this stuff and carry it over, and yeah. put it on the pile, and then somebody would light it, and then and it took off, and mm -hmm. then it was it was going pretty good clip by the time that mortar round went off. So it must, it must have really cooked that mortar round good. Yeah, in the cooking department, uh, were you disposing of 
uh, human waste with uh, the burn it with diesel fuel. I remember, or? yeah, we had a we had a guy from uh, Mayport, Florida. He got exempt from duty for doing this every mm -hmm. day, and uh, all he would do is pull the pull the two half uh, 55 gallon drums out. He pour diesel fuel on them, mm -hmm. and he put fresh ones in, and then that diesel fuel and stuff would burn and burn and burn. But I, I do remember though the whole. Uh, the diarrhea thing made its round. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Boy, that was about, maybe about a month after we were there. And, oh, every, they, they, it was so bad that they would take a huge box of t tissue mm -hmm. and just set it out. You just grab a roll and go wherever. Mm -hmm. You know, it was so bad. Because you still had to work while you had it. You, you didn't get laid up usually. Yep. Oh. Yep. All right. And, uh, it, it was similar to what you had if you've, if you've had it here, you know, from the flu, mm -hmm. you know, but this, this was, it, the onset was so quick. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, that was, that was another little deal. <laughs> Did they have you take anti-malarial stuff? Yeah, we, we, took, uh, we took two of them. Uh, we took the quinine one, that was the orange tablet, and then, we, then they gave you a little uh, white one, that was because of the leper colony that was upriver from mm. us, and we had to take that daily. And uh, it it was a little bit smaller than an aspirin tablet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember then you go into the the mess hall, and he would make you. He'd sit there with his clipboard, and mm -hmm. he'd, he'd watch you take it, make you take it. You couldn't get past him, and, you know, and get in line if you didn't take mm -hmm. it. Well, you didn't get malaria or leprosy. No, it didn't. Okay, so that worked. Well, I'm I'm so happy. I'm really <laughs> I'm happy. All right. I, I I was one of these people that yeah. Well, they they know better, mm -hmm. so they're trying to keep me from getting ill. So I'm I did it. There's some guys that said, I ain't nobody gonna tell me what yeah. to take. Yep. <laughs> all right. Uh, now, when when you flew out, uh, were you on a plane? Did it have guys who've done all kinds of different things who were with you? Do you think you know the guys who had a bit infantry or something or? Most of the guys that I went out with, I did not know at all. Okay, so you have no idea what they did. They or came whatever. in from all over. Yep. And uh, not one guy in my unit was with me going back. Right. Uh, now, was there some kind of, of sense of relief or something else like that once you were off the ground and on your way, or was it not yet that tense on the ground yet for that kind of thing? Not really. The only, the only thing I remember waiting for the uh, Air Force plane at Play Coup was they were, they, the word was we couldn't understand why the airplane was so late. And they said they had trouble closing the clamshell doors in the back of the airplane in, at Clark. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I, I had a little bit of experience already, you know, and I thought, that's one thing you don't want to have come open in flight. Yep. And that, was, that made me a little nervous. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, the, in the Air Force, you always sit facing the rear, too. Mm -hmm. All their seats are in the rear. You, you just face the rear. Yep. And uh, I, I remember, and we didn't have a lot of windows. You just got a little, like a, mm -hmm. where the doors are, is a little portal. And I remember, I, I think I took a couple pictures out the portal coming back. You know, we were up there about over 40,000 feet. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a nice, uneventful flight. Now, when you got back to the States, did you still have time left um, on your hitch before you were done? Yes, I had uh, about five months ago. So and what 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 did you do then for those five months? Well, I I spent a month on on uh, in Grand Rapids on mm -hmm. leave, mm -hmm. and then I had to go. I was assigned to the Fifth Infantry Division, mechanized in, at Fort Carson in Colorado Springs. And I went out there, and uh, me and another mechanic, uh, and he was a United Airlines mechanic. Uh, we were assigned to replace a transmission on a, I don't know if you remember or seen, a OH-13 helicopter. That's mm -hmm. the one with the plastic bubble. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, we had to change the transmission, and our sar uh, maintenance sergeant came up, and he says, I'm, he says, I know you guys are good. He says, so I'm putting you guys on this. So we did it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, we, my, my sergeant at, at Fort Carson, I loved him. He's a nice guy. Nice guy. And... Uh, yeah, it was at Fort, for the, the, for almost the very first thing we did when I got to Fort Carson. We had a field problem we had to go out on. And I said, I just spent 11 months on a field problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we were out on a field problem for a week mm -hmm. out in the, in the Colorado Prairie. And uh, 
Uh, that was another experience. And then I remember the last time I pulled guard duty was on Christmas Eve, out in the middle of nowhere at a motor pool, and it was cold. Mm -hmm. Man, it was cold out there. Boy. And they would, the guy would come up and pick you up, take you back, and the other, other guy, he'd drop the other guy off, and mm -hmm. you go back to this little dingy room with a bunk, and you lay there for three or four hours, and then go back out again. Mm -hmm. You know, if, well, I, I spent the whole 11, 12 months in Vietnam, and I said, now I've got to do this again. Yeah. Now, now, when you came back, did they make any effort to encourage you to re-enlist? Yeah, they did. Yeah. What, what, what could they offer you? Uh, I remember the sergeant in the day room, or the orderly room, would say to me, you know, you go back to those airlines, you know, he says, we, we have got a heck of a good health program here. Mm -hmm. And I says, I've got a good health program with the airlines. And uh, I said, and nobody's shooting at me there yeah. either. <laughs> <laughs> but I, <coughs> I, they always try to re-enlist you, mm -hmm. always. Uh, one of the best things that I ever experienced as I had was in Colorado Springs. We had a foot and wall locker inspection on a Saturday morning. So we're all standing at attention right in front of our bunks, and here comes this full, full bird colonel. And he uh, comes through there, and he, he comes up to me. And he says, uh, he looks at my name, Van, 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 I said, Van Drummel, sir. And he says, uh, Van Drummel, he says, uh, you're going to be going home for Christmas? And I says, no, sir, I'm not. And he says, how come? And he says, I'm getting discharged in January, first week in January. Oh, he said, well, what do you do? And I says, I'm a mechanic with Transworld Airlines. And he says, uh, you know, the Army needs mechanics mm -hmm. bad. And I says, I know, sir. But uh, he says, well, he's best of luck to you. He shook my hand, mm -hmm. best of luck. And he goes on, and the first shirt was right next to him. He comes, the first shirt comes up to me, and he says, money isn't everything. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was great, though. It was a very, very nice, nice person. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Okay. Now, when you got out, did you go back to TWA or did you do something else? Well, for two weeks, yeah, I went back to TWA because they the seniority kept going mm -hmm. right along. And, right. and uh, I went back to O'Hare and uh, loved it. I just loved it. I was back working again. Mm -hmm. I was making money again, mm -hmm. and I was single, and I, bought, I had a brand new little Volkswagen Beetle. And, uh, and I, uh, I remember late leaving Mom's house in Grand Rapids and going down, and it was right after a big, huge snowstorm. It was, I think it was February, first week in February. And uh, I got down near Benton Harbor, and I was going to pull out and path this guy. Mm -hmm. And there was a little bit of snow on the road yet. Pulled out, and I'm, I got way in front of him, and I turned the wheel to go back in the other lane, and the car didn't move. And I said, I'm sliding. And we did. We went right off the side of the road, right into the big, huge uh, snow drift. Mm -hmm. And I was, it was uh, sitting in the dark. And I finally was able to get out on the passenger side. And uh, here comes this wrecker along, saw me, and he says... Uh, let me pull you out? And I said, yeah, but I said, I don't have any money. I said, I've got very little cash. I said, I'm heading back. I'm going to, just got out of the service, heading back to uh, Chicago for work. And well, he says, mm. I wrap, wrap the chain around. He's, I'll pull you out. So he pulled me out. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I got back to work. Yeah, I was, I was very happy. And uh, I, I, I miss camaraderie of talking with people. Uh, Grand Rapids is not really an aviation type town. Mm -hmm. And there's not very many people that I can hang or fly with, whether it be military aviation or, or commercial aviation. And I miss that. I miss that. Now, did you make a career in the airlines, or did you go on to other things? Yeah, I, went on, I, I was made a career. I, I loved it. I, I went from, uh, I, I worked uh, Chicago, Los Angeles, Detroit, and Indianapolis. And uh, Indianapolis was my favorite. Uh, I spent 13 years there, and uh, it was just great. Mm -hmm. Best kept secret in the country, I thought. Uh, it, was, it was not as huge as it is now. Mm -hmm. But it was, uh, we had a nice setup in, uh, in uh, TWA had a nice setup there. Had nonstops to California, oh, New York. I, of course, I like Detroit, though, too. We had nonstops to London and nonstops to Paris. Those were interesting. But, uh, yeah. 
I like that. Now, once you're back, I mean, did, did, did you talk about having been in, in, in Vietnam, or was that just something you put aside someplace and left there? A, l a little bit. I, uh, it, it, if anybody was interested, mm -hmm. I would talk. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I didn't see any of my, uh, my close friends for quite a while because they were all married already mm -hmm. and, and uh, living in different areas. And uh, uh, I talked to my dad. My dad was interested. He was my big supporter. Mm -hmm. dad, was, dad was wonderful. He, uh, dad is the only one that wrote me every week. And whether it be a little like Mike of the weather fine mm -hmm. here, um, how are you doing? You know, and then I would write back and, yeah, the weather's lousy here. We got a monsoon, <laughs> you know. And uh, but Dad wrote all the time, and then and then Dad, uh, I sent Dad a bunch of slides, mm -hmm. and I in my tent, in my little area in my tent in Vietnam, I had this piece of cardboard, and I had a lot of airplane pictures on it, and I took a slide of it. Now I sent the slide to Dad. Well, my dad turns around, he sends him out to Boeing Airplane Company. Mm -hmm. And Boeing Airplane Company took the picture, the slide, put it in their uh, newspaper. And my dad wrote a little letter, and he says, my son, Michael Vandrono, so-and-so, uh, works with the airlines, uh, Transworld Airlines, and uh, he said, we'd like to hear from anybody. And the only people that wrote were women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, had, I started getting <laughs> flooded with girls. And it was, it was amazing. It was amazing and very interesting. I would answer these letters mm -hmm. as much as I could. And uh, there were about six or eight of them that were steady, you know, that were still right. Mm -hmm. You know, after the first couple, you think, well, they're mm -hmm. going to, they won't. But uh, they did. They did. They, uh, and I look back now and, and I go, thanks, Dad. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Now, when you look back at the time that you spent in the service, how, how do you think that wound up affecting you? Did you learn things out of it, or were you any different when you came out than when you went in? I, le I learned a lot from it, and probably, probably one of the, if not the best experience of my life. A uh, little shaky at first. I mean, just, just because I chose to go to school right after graduation mm -hmm. and get my license, probably, or maybe have saved my life, mm -hmm. uh, considering... You know, I could have been in the eye drank valley and brought, come home in a bag. Mm -hmm. So I, I thank God, you know, for watching over me and, uh, yeah. All right. And mom and dad encouraging me. I remember when I went to, wanted to go to California to go to school, my dad said, isn't there another school that's closer? And uh, I says, yeah, there's, there's several of them, but I want to go. Mm -hmm. And he never made an argument again. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Just uh, one other thing kind of comes to mind here. You know, you, you're, you went to Vietnam at the beginning. You're back. You go back into civilian life. You've done your part. Uh, did you pay much attention to what was going on by way of the whole the anti-war movement as that developed and all of the yeah, political the, turmoil that develops in 68, 9, and beyond? Uh, did, what did you think of all that? Well, what I, what I can't get over now is the tremendous support that the troops get mm -hmm. from the country, you know the Afghan thing and and the Iraq thing, and I, I you know, I thought we never got this. Nope. I remember walking through San Fran Airport when I arrived from Travis Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. I was at the airport, and remember the people looking at and dirty looks that they were giving you. Mm -hmm. I had my dress khakis on, my combat boots, and you know, walking down, and you know, what the heck's going on? I have to give Ronald Reagan credit because I think he re, I think he gave the dignity back to the Vietnam veterans. I really do. Uh, I think it's the country guy that collectively figured out, oh, we did that wrong. You know, right or wrong. I mean, whether you think Vietnam was right or wrong, mm -hmm. I he still got to support those guys. Yep. Yeah. You got to support them. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the uh, they sort didn't of make lesson. the decision. Right. The, the decision came from Washington. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, but the guys, you know. You asked most of them. They said, no, I don't want to be here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was true. Even in World War II, a lot of the time, we kind of lose track of that now. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, your, your story actually does make for a good one. It's certainly worth recording. So I'd just like to thank you for coming in and talking to me today. Thank you so much for having me. All right. I appreciate it.